Okay, now it's time to dive into one of the most important, or I guess it's, it's the most important part of implantology. It's what Branamark discovered that day where he's trying to pull out those titanium chambers from rabbits and finding that, that, they're, that they're stuck. So we wanna know why this is all happening. And that's the process of osseointegration. So we wanna understand exactly why osseointegration works. So let's go ahead and dive into the biological process. And it all starts when the implant comes off of this guy right here, the titanium, uh, the, the CNC machine, right? You have this big CNC machine in an implant factory and you have these titanium rods that get stuck inside of the, ma the machine. They get fed into the machine and that machine, um, it basically carves out an implant. So when that titanium rod gets carved, as the layers get carved out, they expose fresh new layers of titanium or titanium alloy. And as soon as that fresh layer of titanium gets exposed to the air, something really special happens. So the first thing is that the oxygen in the air, it comes in right away. So immediately the oxygen in the air comes in and it starts to accumulate here on the surface. So we have this, we have this oxygen accumulation on the surface. So now we have on the deep parts of the implant, the, the inside part of the implant, the, you know, under the surface, you have the native titanium or titanium alloy. And on the outside, we have something special. We have oxidation, we have titanium oxide. So this forms an oxide layer, the titanium oxide layer. And what's really special about this, it's basically just, you know, titanium rust. But what's really special about this is that this protects the layers inside and it makes this surface bioactive. It's what leads to the bioactivity, the biocompatibility of titanium. It is what makes titanium special. So we have now a titanium, let me write that out. We now have a titanium oxide layer, okay, and that is written as TiO2, titanium, titanium dioxide, actually, it's titanium dioxide, okay? It's an oxide layer, but it's titanium dioxide, technically. So let's go ahead and, and see how that plays a role in this next part here, because this next part is very important. So after you, after you place your implant into the bone, after you've, you know, you've made your osteotomy, you've made a wound, in the bone, now you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna place your implant. And you already have this titanium oxide layer, right? You already have that, I'm gonna draw it right here. You already have that titanium oxide layer and that just happens as soon as it touches air. The next thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna have these things inside the bone, inside the blood, that are sort of floating around, right? They're like in the patient's natural tissue. And these guys are blood proteins. So the blood proteins that we're looking at, they're fibrinogen, they're vitronectin, and fibronectin. So, okay, so th those are the three. So fibrinogen, vitronectin, and fibronectin, they're, they're just floating around, and they're actually starting to be attracted to this layer. So now you start to have a new layer here. You're starting to have a new layer on this titanium surface. And this surface, you can think of it as like a sticky surface now. This is now a implant that is covered with the sticky surface, okay, of these blood proteins. And these guys are, are um, adsorbed. It's called adsorption. Let me write it. Adsorption. <laughs> so absorption is taking stuff inside adsorption is taking stuff and putting it to the surface. So that's what's happening here. These blood proteins are adsorbed, okay? So now that we have that jelly stick, you know, jelly-like sticky surface, now we're, the implant is ready for the next part, okay? This next part is where these blood proteins start to attract cells. Okay, there's several different cells that are important in this process. There's mesenchymal stem cells, there's osteoblasts, there's macrophages, there's endothelial cells. So I'm not gonna draw them all out, okay? I'll just draw them the same color, all right? So we have these cells out here 
that are all very important in the process. And now these guys are attracted to this. The reason that they're attract, uh, attracted to that is because these guys have little receptors, okay? These guys have integrin receptors, integrin receptors. I'm gonna write it out, integrin, integrin receptors. Now the integrin receptors recognize patterns on these blood proteins that are already stuck to the implant surface. Now they recognize those patterns and they start to attract the cells to that surface. Okay, now integrin receptors are very important because of their particular properties. Okay, so let me go ahead and, and erase this off. And the reason that integrin receptors are important is that they mediate adhesion, that's their function, adhesion. Okay, they mediate adhesion in a very controlled manner. They also aid in signal transduction. They aid in signal trans transduction. So now we have the cells that are out here that are stuck uh, here. So these guys are connected. And now we have a way to send signals back and forth, right? We have a way, oops. We have a way to send signals back and forth here, okay? So that's, that's what's happening over here now. And the other thing that's, that's really beneficial about integrin receptors is that there's many types. So that means that there's a wide range of ligands to stick to. There's a wide, wide range of things that it's gonna identify on that protein, on that implant surface now, that are gonna, are gonna attract the cells that are needed for the next phase. All right, so now we're moving on to the inflammatory phase. So you've caused a wound inside the patient's bone and you have your implant sitting there inside of that wound. So let's go ahead and draw that. So you have the implant sitting in the bone. There's maybe, you know, like a little gap right there. So now what's gonna happen is you have to clear out the debris. The debris has to be cleared out and the, the stage has to be set for the remodeling and, and, and adding of bone, right? So we have our macrophages. They're gonna be coming in. Okay, they're gonna be coming in and clear, clearing out the debris. And we also have our osteoprogenitor cells. So osteoprogenitor cells, they're the ones that are gonna turn in to osteoblasts, right? The osteoprogenitor cells are gonna turn into osteoblasts and um, they're gonna be getting ready to play a role in bone remodeling. Now this whole process, this whole process of uh, this inflammatory response and, and, and the migration of cells, that's all regulated by cytokines and growth factors. Now the, the growth factors that we're talking about here is TGF beta. So that's gonna be controlling uh, angi angiogenesis and fibrosis. We also have PD, PDGF, okay? And that's gonna be regulating cell prol proliferation and migration. And the last one here is fibroblast growth factors that play a role in angiogenesis. Um, so it's gonna be, this process is modulated, is carefully balanced because um, you don't want too big of an inflammatory response. That would be detrimental to osseo integration. Um, you want it to be very, very well controlled. Okay, so now let's move on to this Next part, and you'll see that growth factors actually play a role throughout this entire process. So what happens here is that you have a mesenchymal stem cell, mesenchymal stem cell, MSC, all right? And it's pluripotent, right? It could become many different things. And that, uh, as a result of these growth factors, growth factors, I mean, there was, there's several, right? TGF, beta, whatever. So anyway, these, these growth factors, modulate this process whereby a stem cell becomes a osteoblast, osteoblast. And this process is called osteoinduction, osteoinduction. So that's turning a stem cell into an osteoblast. So now this is happening, right? We're getting more of these, um, osteoblasts forming. So now what we're gonna do is take a look at what happens next. 
So the next thing is these osteoblasts, what they do is they secrete bone matrix. So they're just, they're just shooting out bone matrix everywhere. And it's, it's just like blobs of bone matrix. Okay. There's like some collagen in there too, collagen, bone matrix, a lot of stuff that it's just, this is shooting out. And what's happening over here is you have phosphate and you have calcium. Now these guys are going to come from the bloodstream and they're going to join in right here they're gonna be adding themselves, they're gonna be depositing themselves into that bone matrix uh, area, right? So we're gonna have calcium and phosphate, calcium and phosphate all over. And so that osteoblast is gonna keep creating bone matrix all around itself, okay? Lots of bone matrix everywhere. And then you still have those collagen strands, right? You got lots of collagen and you're still having more deposits of calcium and phosphate. And guess what's happening? that starts to mineralize, that starts to actually get harder. It gets harder and harder, and then the osteoblast finds itself now in a situation where it's completely surrounded by bone matrix, and that bone matrix is now calcified. It can't move any longer. It can't move at all. It can't even uh, produce any more bone matrix. So actually at this point, that is no longer an osteoblast. At this point, this turns into an it says no longer an osteoblast, it turns into an osteocyte. Okay, it's now called an osteocyte. And an osteocyte has a different role than an osteoblast. An osteocyte is maintaining this. Okay, whereas osteoblast is building the bone, osteocyte is maintaining the bone. And this, this home where he lives in, so he finds himself stuck in this little, this little uh, circular home, that's called a, let me write it in a different, color that's called a lacunae. Lacunae. Okay, lacuna, lacunae. All right, so that's what that looks like. So the, the, our osteoblast friend now finds himself inside, trapped inside of a lacunae with mineralized bone. So you start to see the bone turn from looking like this to looking like this. That's just bone maturation. So while initially, we're looking at bone that's like matrixy, it's all soft, it's like, it doesn't have very much pattern to it. That's called woven, a woven pattern of bone, woven bone to lamellar. Woven to lamellar. And inside here you can see that they have, it's a very, very distinct pattern of bone. So when you're looking at uh, the histology of it, it's very, very cool. You can actually see exactly where the osteocytes are. You know, they're the ones that are, that are trapped. Um, and it's very interesting to, to see that, that pattern of change between immature bone and mature bone. So this process is happening on two fronts. So let's look at our implant here. These are the threads. And here is the bone again, okay. So this process is happening on multiple fronts. There are osteoblasts that are migrating here and are starting to, to make de novo bone right here, right? So they're starting to place bone right here, right on the implant surface. So you can see they're, they're laying it down right there. So that is called contact osteogenesis. Okay, contact osteogenesis. That's where de novo bone grows directly on the implant site. Now on the other side, there are osteoblasts over here, but what happens to the osteoblasts that are actually on the surface of the bone right here, because we did some high speed drilling, well, hopefully we didn't do too high speed, too high of a speed, because high speeds create heat, and that heat is killing these osteoblasts. So either way, some of, the, some of them are gonna be dead, but we try to limit our speeds to try to limit the thermal activity that we're causing here. But in any case, some have died off, and so actually these are going to go away. All right, these are gonna, these are gonna go away, and some of that bone over here will get remodeled by osteoclasts. Okay, so some of this bone right here on the surface is getting uh, remodeled by osteoclasts, but there are also osteoblasts that are coming to the surface. There are osteoblasts that are coming to the surface, all right, after that initial dieback of, of that layer. Um, and these osteoblasts on this surface are also adding bone. Okay, so the osteoblasts on this surface are also 
uh, creating bone on this side. So over here, we have contact osteogenesis. And on this side, we have um, distance osteogenesis. And the idea is that the two sides will create bone until they join in the middle. And so now we have bone that's forming around our implant. It's, it's directly being placed on the implant. And, and that process is modulated by osteoclasts and osteoblasts. It's a dynamic equilibrium. It's not like once that process is complete, it, it's static from then on. So you're gonna have, you're gonna have your osteoclasts, let's make them osteoclasts and osteoblasts. These guys are both gonna be um, performing maintenance on that area. And that maintenance basically depends on stresses that are put on the implant, uh, depends on a lot of, on health of the patient, on a lot of different things. So that, that dynamic equilibrium is what defines osteointegration over the long run. So it, you can see it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a process, right? It starts with an inflammatory response as a result of the wound and cells come stick onto the implant surface because it's got this bioactive titanium dioxide layer. And then there's bone building that takes place. And then finally you have a dynamic equilibrium that's maintained by the osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And although we're not scientists here, we're not, we know we're not bioengineers, I think it's still really important that we keep in mind this biological process uh, while we're trying to achieve the best results possible, we understand that there are really important things at work here. It's not just placing a screw into bone, but it's understanding that the, that the patient should have this ability for wound healing, this ability for uh, building bone. And that's why uh, these other things might interfere with that. Like for example, if the patient's taking any medications that interfere with an inflammatory process, or if the patient's taking um, bisphosphonates, for example. So that's why it's really important to understand this biological process.